Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And from the New King James Version, the Apostle Paul writing, and he says this, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Notice the churches of Macedonia, talking about churches in homes. And Macedonia is a region. That in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. He's saying, guys, this is counterintuitive that people are in deep poverty, and yet in deep poverty, they're abounding with liberality. Why? Because they know they're not the only ones suffering. They're not the only ones hurting. And so right in the middle of struggling, right in the middle of financial deficiency, what are they doing? They're being liberal. They're being generous to others. And so he said, I want you to know this, that in this great trial of affliction, they're doing this. Verse 3, For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Now this is a very interesting concept because Paul is really saying that, that he was, in a sense, telling them, oh, no, you guys, you have your own needs. Don't, don't give. Don't try to give out of your poverty situation, out of your lack, this affliction that you're in right now, this financial uh, famine that you're in. Don't try to give right now. And yet they persisted and they insisted that he would take the gift and go distribute it to others who were in need. But he says this in verse 4, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. So Paul introduces this uh, really coming from the Macedonian churches, and he's saying, no, they, they see this not as just a financial trans transaction, but they see this as fellowship among their brethren. In other words, these are our brothers and sisters. They're treating People who are in the Lord, believers in Jesus, who are of another culture, another country, another region, another language, no doubt, they're treating them like they're their own family, like this is my mom, my dad, my son, my daughter, my brother, my sister. They're saying, no, we want to help them. These are our brothers and sisters. And this is the love that the Lord wants in the body of Christ that we have this same affection for one another. And when we see somebody hurting, even if we're also hurting, that we, we look and find a way to help them. And interesting, even people we've never met before, but if they're in the body of Christ, we want to help them. This is a precious concept. And they call it fellowship. They call it fellowship. This is part of the fellowship among believers, even believers who have never met. So it goes on to say now in verse 5, And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Not only did they give themselves to the Lord, but then they extended themselves to us. So they've committed themselves to the Lord, but they've committed themselves to the brothers and sisters in Christ as well. Verse 6, So we urged Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. So Paul's saying, now Titus, one of my partners in the ministry, that Titus has been sent to you, and he, uh, he announced to you that you also, Corinthians, all the house churches of the city of Corinth that collectively make up the church at Corinth, he's saying he announced to you that you also have this opportunity that you can send uh, 
generously even in your affliction and poverty or lack you can send as well verse 7 but as you abound in everything in faith in speech in knowledge in all diligence and in your love for us see that you abound in this grace also very interesting he brings up another term before he talked talked about financial generosity as fellowship among believers but now he talks about it as a grace abound in this grace also. So he's talking to the Corinthian church, and the Corinthian church is very a very spiritual church. Now in 1 Corinthians 3, he says you're spiritual, but you're not that spiritually mature. So they're filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, the power and manifestations, gifts of the Spirit are flowing very freely. And he says, you, listen, you're abounding in faith. You're abounding in speech. You're able to talk the word and uh, to preach the word and such, uh, to speak right according to the word. You're abounding in knowledge. You're abounding in diligence. You're abounding in your love for us, the apostles who are ministering to you. He said, but I'm asking you to add this to your abounding. And that is add being generous in your giving particularly toward those who are in the body of Christ. And so, and he calls it a grace. I'm asking you to be diligent in this grace also. Now, why does he call it a grace? Well, you know what grace is. Grace means that you receive something that you did not earn. It came by grace. And it's unmerited favor or unearned help. And he's saying, abound in this grace also. Well, why would it be called grace? Well, a couple of reasons. One is because all of the blessings that we have, they come from God ultimately. You may think, well, they come from my job or I work hard uh, or I received an inheritance from my parents. Okay, those are the conduits. Those are the means by which it got to you. But all blessing comes from God. Nobody on this earth could eat or drink or breathe without God providing the resources here on this earth. So we always have to go back to the source, and that's God. And so he says, whatever you're doing, it's by grace that you received something because you couldn't create plants, vegetables, fruits. You could not create uh, the animals that can be eaten. You, you couldn't create all that. Only God did it. He said, so everything you have is by grace anyway. And then, of course, when you give something to another brother or sister when you extend generosity to other people who did not earn it, guess what it is? That's called grace. And so this is grace coming to you and this is grace going from you. Jesus said to his disciples, freely you've received, freely give. And so he calls this generosity a grace. And then verse 8, I speak not by commandment, but I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. Now, you remember that Paul said earlier in this book that when he was writing in 1 Corinthians and he told them to do something specific with a certain uh, person in their church who was committing sexual immorality. And in 2 Corinthians, he said, I, I asked you to do that because I was testing your obedience. But now he's telling them about generosity. He's saying, I'm not commanding this, but... I'm asking you and testing the sincerity of your love. So he said, I am, I am watching you to see what you'll do with this. But he said, I'm not commanding you to do it. Verse 9, for, and oh, this verse right here is not preached on very much, but listen to what it says. It says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Oh, now I know that can be applied to spiritual things that uh, we were spiritually disconnected from God. We were spiritually dead, we human beings. But Jesus came down and he died that we might become spiritually alive and have the blessings, spiritual blessings and such. No doubt that applies. But in this context, he's talking about financial resources. So to be uh, hermeneutically uh, proper, you have to first apply this to the context. And he's talking about finances. And he says, well, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus. So he, so he calls it grace again. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich. What does that mean? Well, he was in heaven with God. In fact, he is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's three persons, but one God. He was God and, and still is. But he was in heaven with Father God, 
for eternity past, heaven. I mean, beautiful streets of gold, the Bible says. Talk about wealth. The earth has never seen wealth like that before. And Paul says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he gave that up, came down to earth, and was born into a very modest, humble little family, and uh, who hadn't even become a family yet. His mom and dad were betrothed, but not yet married. And then they went ahead and got married before Jesus was born. He was born into this, uh, born into this humble family, uh, laid in a manger, a feed trough. And he's saying he gave up all of that wealth, lavish wealth of heaven to become poor. But notice this, that you, through his poverty, might become rich, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. So he's saying Jesus exemplified this and modeled this for us, that he gave up what he could have had so that you could have something. And uh, oh, what an amazing thing. And, and this whole last word of that verse, that you might become rich. Well, uh, me being in America, I know very well about the American greed and the love of money. I mean, this is very prominent in our nation, among others. And so whenever we see that, oh, we have to, you know, put a stop sign up and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. That doesn't mean that Jesus came down just so we could uh, become um, uh, consumed with materialism and money, and mammon, and well, that's what it says. He wants us to be rich. and Well, that, that doesn't mean rich in the sense of being materialistic or mammon, because Jesus himself said, you cannot serve two masters, you cannot serve God and mammon. So we know God doesn't want us to do that. That's not what he's saying. However, rich means a full supply. Rich means you, you have everything you need, and, and even more so. Your cup runs over, as Psalm 23 says. And so... But this says that Jesus came for this purpose. And here Paul's preaching this to the Corinthians while he's talking to them about being generous. He's saying, now, now you remember, though, that Jesus came and gave up so much so that you might be rich. In other words, he's getting ready to tell them, and he'll tell them in the next chapter, if you're generous and you give, don't be, uh, don't be deceived to think that God's not going to bless you for that because he is going to bless you for that. Think about this. God the Father gave one son on the cross, but he reaped many sons back and daughters, thank God. And so he's bringing this up, that Jesus modeled this generosity so that others might be blessed even more than he was. And so it goes on to say in verse 10, And in this grace I give advice. It is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago, but now you also must complete the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to desire it, so there also may be a completion out of what you have. So Paul is bringing up now saying, now we brought this to you about a year ago and you vocally, you orally said, oh, yeah, oh, we'll definitely be a part of that. We'll definitely do that. And Paul's saying, okay, it's been a year, and uh, there hasn't been follow-through yet. Uh, and maybe they're not behind, because maybe it was something that was planned for the future. But nonetheless, Paul's saying a year ago, now you committed to do this, but it's time to follow through with this. And so that, that's true for a lot of us. We can make commitments to be generous, to give, to tithe, or whatever. But Paul's saying you need to follow through, because it's not just the uh, initial willingness, but the follow-through shows your true heart. Verse 12, for if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what one does not have. So Paul's saying, I'm not asking that you consider giving beyond what you have. This would really speak to the idea, well, you know, I don't have any money. Should I put something on a credit card and go into debt to give? Well, I'm not saying that that should never happen, but I'm just saying, that Paul is saying here, I'm not asking you to give beyond what you have, but from what you have, even if it's little, like the widow with two mites. She didn't go into debt, but she gave literally everything she had left. And Jesus said, because of that, she gave more than all these people giving large gifts. And so 
Uh, he said, I'm just looking for you to give from what you actually have. Verse 13, for I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance. So the Corinthians evidently were walking or they were doing really well. Their economy was doing well, where the Macedonians, they were uh, struggling. So he says that in this time of your abundance, uh, may supply their lack and their abundance also may supply your lack. So he's saying, hey, let's help each other in the body of Christ. And if another economy is not doing so well, those of you that have a good economy, be helpful to them. What is this? This is precious. And this is this needs to be brought up. This needs to be taught about. We need to see how to do this because the Bible is showing us something that I don't think is practiced very much in our world today. But we need, to, we need to do it. We need to figure out how the Lord wants us to do this. Uh, that there may be equality. So equality, and we both give when we have the abundance to those who lack. Verse 15, as it is written, he who gathers much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. This is a quote from the Old Testament uh, talking about the manna, if you remember. Verse 16, but thanks be to God, who puts the same earnest care for you into the heart of who put the same earnest care for you into the heart of Titus for he not only accepted the exhortation but being more diligent he went to you of his own accord Paul saying I didn't even have to send him to do it verse 18 and we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches and not only that but who was also chosen by the churches to travel with us with this gift, which is administered by us to the glory of the Lord himself, and to show your ready mind. Verse 20, avoiding this, that anyone should blame us in this lavish gift, which is administered by us, providing honorable things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. He's saying, don't blame us. Now, we're going to be carrying the gift and we'll make sure it's distributed. But don't blame us as if this is just an offering that goes directly to us, uh, Paul and his ministry partners. Verse 22, and we have sent with them our brother, whom we have often proved diligent in many things, but how much more diligent because of the great confidence which we have in you. Now, notice Paul is identifying there's a certain brother that has credibility. He he is trusted because of his character. And, you know, that's the same way as it, it is today. You know, when people give, they want to put it into the hands of a person or a ministry that is trustworthy. And so Paul is saying, look, um, we sent with Titus this trustworthy person so that, you know, they're not going to uh, that this gift is actually going to get to the people uh, for whom it was intended. Verse 23, if anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker concerning you. In other words, if anybody has a question about his character, you need to know he's with me and he's a partner, so I vouch for him. Or if our brethren are inquired about, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. Therefore, show to them and before the churches the proof of your love and our boasting on your behalf. He's saying, make sure to uh, show them love and prove that our boasting about you and your willingness to be generous, your willingness to help people and to partner, make sure that, my, that our boasting about you uh, is validated by the way that you respond to what I'm saying here. So this chapter and much of the next chapter is about giving about giving finances, about being generous and such. The Bible talks about money a lot, by the way. And uh, God is our provider, and He wants us to be generous just like He is generous.